cord to this computer. Ah, tenakoto katoa. Good morning, Paul. Uh, it's morning here in New Zealand, but it's uh, afternoon yesterday for you. So yep. it's nice to time travel like this. <laughs> um, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, for watchers of this video, um, I've known Paul since so nearly more than 10 years now when we met in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I'm reaching out to Paul for this conversation is because of his academic work. And I'd like to just quickly point you to his uh, academic work that's available on um, Amazon. He wrote this hilarious memoir of his life and times in Hong Kong, and we remember some of these events as they happened. He's written a guide for college faculty of how to do general education, and I've spoken with uh, Paul previously uh, concerning how we do general education compared to how uh, universities or liberal arts colleges in the U.S. do it. And more importantly, I think for us indeed talking about the curriculum transformation framework, Paul's published the book, uh, Creating Wicked Students, Designing Courses for Complex World. And during, since that time, that's become a quite a hit around the world in universities, trying to design courses to make students transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, deep thinkers, complex thinkers, and, and it's that kind of experience and insight that Paul has that made me want to uh, have this conversation with him in light of the University of Auckland's um, uh, efforts to improve, design, shape its curriculum in a new way um, in the current strategic directions. Paul is a professor at Washington and Lee University. It's a uh, elite liberal arts college. He's a professor of, tell me, Paul, professor of, <laughs> I know you as an English <laughs> rhetoric guy. <laughs> They've got me in education studies here. Okay. <laughs> so go and, figure. And for those interested, it's Professor Paul Honstead. Um, mm -hmm. So we use the German kind of pronunciation, but your Norwegian ancestry, is that right? That is that is that is correct. When I walk into a, a grocery store in Oslo, they start speaking Norwegian to me without even asking. So yes, you yeah. and you go yashnaka <laughs> ikonorsk. <laughs> yeah, I just nod politely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mm, <taksimika>. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, thank you, Paul. I've sent you a bunch of documents that the university is working on in terms of a curriculum transformation framework, and you've had a chance to briefly overview them to get a sense of where we're going. And I want to start by saying um, these are really laudable goals to try and solve some of the problem of narrow minded specialization. And I wanted to talk to you about this because we're a research intensive, comprehensive university, publicly funded. So we don't have deep pockets like private universities. And um, we're in the British model of a 13 year school system and a three year degree system, unlike mm -hmm. the 12 plus four system that China, the USA, even Hong Kong has now. And as a research university, I, as I looked at the curriculum transformation ideas, I thought, this feels like a liberal arts college. So can I ask you, Paul, based on your experience uh, across the world in my, many universities, do you think that what you advocate for wicked curriculum is just something that liberal arts colleges can do, or can this be done in research intensive environments? It can be done in research intensive environments. Um, across the United States, you're going to find the liberal arts at almost every single institution you find, regardless of size. Um, mm -hmm. uh, from a huge land grant university like the University of Wisconsin or the University of Michigan um, to uh, two small liberal arts colleges. So it, it can be done. And I think it's an interesting question of just how effectively 
it is it is being done. Um, and I think you can what will surprise you perhaps is that you can't necessarily graph how effectiveness where it lands. Mm -hmm. that you're going to find some large universities that are doing it very effectively. You're going to find some small liberal arts colleges, which is their, their bread and potatoes, um, or bread and potatoes, meat and potatoes, rather, bread and butter, um, where it's not being done particularly effectively. Okay. So it, it has to do a lot with the degree of deliberation, how thoughtfully, how carefully they're doing it. Obviously, there's always a political implication for this. Mm -hmm. I think there's really important to think about in terms of the faculty as well, the ways in which our identities as scholars and or teachers comes into play. I'll always think about uh, Deborah Humphreys, who is now a, a VP for Lumina Foundation. She talks about how statistically in the United States, faculty are more likely to leave a spouse than they are a tenure track position. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so you're right. <laughs> you know, we're deeply invested in who we are in the university and how the university constructs our identity and how we're able to construct our identity there. I think, um, so deliberation is going to be the first component. So it really begins with thinking about what are the goals of the institution. And when I re read through the, the Auckland materials, um, a couple things stood out. That initial goal of breadth, and that's how you framed it as well. And I think that's really very important, obviously. The acknowledgement in that document that that original goal is being left behind. Mm -hmm. um, but then I would also take it a step further in a couple of different directions. One, the goal of breadth isn't a goal for breadth's sake. Mm -hmm. It's a goal because of the recognition that A, our students might not go into the fields that they study. Mm -hmm. B, they might not stay in the fields that mm -hmm. they study. Mm -hmm. C, if they go into the fields that they study and they stay in those fields, as they get promoted, they're going to going to increasingly encounter things they never encountered before that they haven't mm -hmm. been trained for. So I've got a very good friend who's an architect mm -hmm. and his first couple of years at the firm that he got hired at, he was fine because he was working with the graphing and the designing and the drawing. And then he got promoted and suddenly he was working with clients. He hadn't been prepared for that before. Yeah. And some interesting situations. At one point, the, the synagogue in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, mm -hmm. wanted to, to uh, expand their space. They, had, they didn't have enough space in the synagogue. And so what he proposed was moving out to the, the country uh, around. You could get a larger plot of land. You could build a bigger synagogue. And they looked at him and they said, do you not understand how important it is for our Jewish community to be visible in Charlottesville, Virginia? So mm -hmm. there's a cultural element that suddenly came into play. Mm -hmm. And he got promoted again. He was suddenly doing hiring. And then he got promoted again. And he was working with zoning boards. So the careers we take, there's only so much the education can do to prepare us for those careers. Mm -hmm. And then add to this as well that we live in this complex, rapidly changing world. This mm -hmm. phone, when you and I met, <laughs> didn't exist. Um, so very primitive. I had a very, very primitive. primitive. Okay, very primitive. For, yeah, actually, actually, you probably did, didn't you? Whereas we 3G, have you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so the technology is changing, the politics is changing. I mean, in the United States, if you told me in 2000, and I remember getting picked up at the airport in January of 2016 and hearing that Trump had won the Iowa caucuses and the person who picked me up, we laughed, we chuckled. Oh, well now he's, he's, he's a Republican party's problem. Uh, no, actually he became the United States problem and then he became the world's problem at the same time that authoritarianism was rising all over the world, authoritarianism and populism. So the world is changing very quickly. Our students, our graduates need to be agile. Uh -huh. They need to be able to respond to the demands of their career, of the organization that hires them. So breadth is meaningful, but not in and of itself. Breadth is meaningful because it teaches agility, uh -huh. a movement the ability to respond quickly to different dynamics, to take ideas and perspectives from over here and apply them over here, oftentimes to problems we've never seen before. Yeah. So I love seeing that goal in there. The other way that I would kind of um, 
expand sort of the goals and thinking about my reading of the the Auckland documents that you you sh you shared with me um, is a recognition that if we are not deliberate in designing our curricula, mm -hmm. those curricula will be inequitable uh -huh. and exclusive. That there will mm -hmm. be some students who are high performing or privileged in some ways or multiple ways who can come in and they can negotiate the educational system and the world after the educational system and they'll be fine yeah and there are other students there's i can't remember the term we talk about them as first gen students first generation okay. students. i know there's another term there um who will come in in this <clears throat> curriculum and the hidden curriculum behind it which means not just what we're asking them to do but why we're asking mm -hmm. them to do it. I mean, the documents you showed me talked about the how and the what. I like to think about the what and the why. Mm -hmm. We see what's being asked of us, but we don't know why. Unless I'm a privileged upper middle class white kid who comes from a highly educated family and I see the what and I understand the why. So yeah. if you have a system where there's not a transparency, where the model is not self-articulating, where a student from whatever any background can come in and look at it and go, ah, I see wh why they're asking me to do this. Mm -hmm. The level of engagement and the level of success are going to be um, inequitable. Sure. So out of all the institutions you've had interaction with, are there, can you give us an example of an R1 research intensive university in the, anywhere in the world that you think is kind of doing it okay if not great yeah yeah <clears throat> yeah and i'm glad you phrased it in terms of r1 and and you and i talked prior to this about how a, elite institutions are kind of irre irrelevant you know they're they're you know i remember being in hong kong and they're saying well what is harvard doing and what is stanford doing and i'm like do you you don't have the students of harvard you don't have the students of, of stanford nor do you have the goals nor do we have the goals a lot of the innovation that you find occurs in institutions that you wouldn't expect it. And oftentimes because they have to fight <laughs> for their survival. And so they're, or oftentimes because they're not locked down by tradition mm -hmm. and they're able to innovate more successfully as a consequence of that. Right. So I would point to some interesting models. Um, Clemson University has just revised okay. its gen ed curriculum ah. and they, um, it's, it's called the, I think it's like Crossways or something like that. If you simply cool. Google Wicked Problems Clemson University, uh -huh. about the ninth one down, it'll pop up, you know, okay. Clemson's new core curriculum. And you can go in there and look at that. Uh -huh. um, but it begins with these courses called Challenges courses. Uh -huh. I think it's, it's credits of that, so two courses, where they're taking on the complex problems of the world. Mm -hmm. And they're, and this is a first year seminar. Uh -huh. and so a couple things that happen in that when it, when students engage a complex problem in, um, right away, and this occurs by the way, uh, Clemson, Plymouth State is another place that does this. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at some of the Dutch universities, the university colleges like Groningen, I've been working a lot with okay. them. They have a first year seminar where immediately students dive into a complex problem. Mm -hmm. The consequence of that is that the why is made self-evident immediately, mm -hmm. um, which is a more equitable system. All students suddenly get, oh, I see why we're doing this, why I have to study these, why I have to study these different things, how I'm going to have to bring them together, what my role is in bringing them together. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that some of that synthesis mm -hmm. um, needs to occur on the student level. So um, I've mentioned Clemson, Plymouth State is another example. Worcester Polytechnic, uh, which is an engineering university in Western Massachusetts, okay, has a yes. very good general education model. Um, that is based upon an intensive problem-based semester in the sophomore year, the second year, and an intensive problem-based semester in the senior year, where they're working in a small team with a, a university professor to solve a real-world problem. I ever, already mentioned the, the Dutch universities. Um, there is a place called uh, Drury University in Springfield, Missouri. I don't know if it's necessarily R1, but they have designed 
Um, it, and there's, there's, they have sort of a compromised model right now, ignore the compromised part, look at the idealistic part. <laughs> but what they've got is a model that has two asynchronous learning communities, one called um, work, the other one called life. And yeah deals with the complex problem. Students take four courses and it ends with a mini capstone course. Mm -hmm. So there are models out there that are thoughtful. If I may go so far as to point this out, one thing that was really powerful about the language in the literature that you sent me was it was consistently referenced evidence-based practices. Mm -hmm. right? And we have research in the United States for, for high impact practices. Um, mm -hmm. George Koo, working with the uh, National Survey of Student Engagement, um, identified 10, and now he's expanded it to 11, um, practices where the more students encountered them, the more they left the university capable of dealing with complex problems, of working collaboratively, of communicating effectively, of thinking critically. And this even overperformed for students of color or other, in other okay. ways, first generation students, students uh, who came into university with lower grade point averages, mm -hmm. um, first, first generation students. Um, so what you starting to what you find a little bit in in some of these models that we're seeing at um, Worcester Poly, for instance, at Clemson, for instance, um, in the Netherlands, are some of these high impact practices coming into play? Mm -hmm. Paying particular attention, for instance, to the first year, paying particular attention to some sort of capstone where students are required to synthesize their learning in a meaningful way and produce something as a means of doing that. There's a small, I'm working right now with the uh, Vermont State Colleges system. They've all been told that they need to combine, combine from four separate universities into one. Okay. Lucky them. <laughs> <laughs> Downsizing uh, all the way. <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah. Um, one of those universities, Castleton State University has a, a really, what I find a, as a, a very striking model where it's a lot of distribution. You know, there's, there's writing courses and there's, you know, social science courses and natural science courses and, and humanities and arts courses. But running down the spine of that distributional model is a first year seminar that it pays explicit attention to the transition into what university life is like, what university thinking is like, what university writing is like, mm -hmm. um, serves as a bridge. And again, that of course really is, is crucial for bringing in the historically marginalized students that we care so much about. Right. Um, and then it has a sort of a sophomore junior level course where they meet again. So really only two courses and then a senior capstone course where they take everything that they've learned and they apply it. Right. Connected to all of those is an e-portfolio. Uh-huh. Which is George Ku's 11th high impact practice. Okay. What he argues about an e-portfolio, and I'm going somewhere with this, trust me. <laughs> I, I know I'm going into the weeds right here, but bear with me. Um, what he... What they recognize about an impactful e-portfolio is it's not just a place where students archive their learning. Yes. It's not just a place where institutions can assess, right? Yes. And get the data that they want. Those things can happen. But really what's happening there is you're designing reflective moments where students are deepening their learning, they're synthesizing their learning and they're constructing a professional identity. Yes. And, and it also, I guess, an identity as a citizen. Yeah. You know, they're figuring out who they are. They're not just, education isn't just happening to them and they're not just going through education. They're reflecting, they're tying it together. They're making meaning out of it. Okay. Here's where I'm going with that. An e-portfolio, you could have a curriculum. You could take, you could, an institution could probably take a pure distribution model and write thoughtful, careful, deliberative e-portfolios into that mm -hmm. and bring it together in very powerful ways. They're going to improve the impact, take the impact further, make it more equitable, um, right. make it more inclusive. Um, yes. Can I say here that 
in all the examples you've given me, you've used the language of first, second, third, and final year. It's it's built around a four-year degree, which is the norm in most of the world. Um, we're still cursed, Ben. <laughs> I, I, yeah. We still live in a world where we only have a three-year university degree system. In your experience, do you think that we could achieve some of the things that you've described um, within a three-year intensive degree system? Is that yeah. feasible? Yeah. Yes. So let me give, a, I'll give a multi-part answer. And, and for those um, people who've never met me before, I, I did do a PhD in Victorian literature. So I do tend to talk in whole paragraphs and I apologize for that. <laughs> so um, one, the Dutch universities are three years. Oh, okay. They're on the Bologna, they're on the Bologna model. Okay. So they, they have to be. Uh, two, you know, even the model that I just pointed out with Castleton, where they had a, you know, a first year course, a second or third year course, and then a fourth year course, that fits very nicely into a three year model, obviously, mm -hmm. in fact, much more nicely, because you can, it's students will see it coming, and they, they'll know when it's coming, it's going to happen at the beginning of my first year, it's going to happen at the beginning of my second year, and maybe it's going to happen at the end of my third year. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's that moment for syn synthesis. That's really the important thing. Where do we put the pieces together? And how do we think about how those pieces project into the future? That's where that agility comes from. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, that's where we start to work towards that agility. Not just here's what I've learned, but how does it fit in with who I am? How does it fit in with the problems of the world? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I, I think I would say about this is, is it's important for um, I, I understand the ways in which majors can be very large. Yes. Curricular wise. Um, and oftentimes there are two causes for that. One is an external cause. Mm -hmm. Um, there's an accreditation body that says, oh, you need this, 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 yes. and this. And, and sometimes, um, you know, and it, even with that external thing, it can operate in a number of different ways. You're the person who actually pointed out to me that in Canada, um, architecture students are required by their accrediting body to have general education. Mm -hmm. So there can be there can be times where the accreditation agencies can be the the good person <laughs> pushing the wrong thing, you know, right? There can be times where the accreditation agency can very clearly have an agenda where they're trying to ramp up. You know, I, I remember once talking to somebody who was frustrated, an administrator who was frustrated with the interior design accrediting body that had decided that students needed <laughs> you know 120 credits worth of nothing but interior design and and you know that's a that's a nice way of making sure that the the interior design professors have work um not to be not to pick on them um and of course there can be accrediting agencies that aren't thinking about these things at all i've worked with an institution in in the state of indiana and i in their nursing program is is got a, has a a lot of pressure from the Indiana yes. accrediting board for nursing. And there's a little bit of a paradox there because nurses know, I mean, of all the fields, nursing is one of the fields where they know they need to change constantly. They need to be able to adapt constantly to different populations, to different audiences, to different technologies, to different roles, to different demands. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a real uh, issue there. The other a uh, thing that can, of course, lead to uh, a, a really very large major is the will of the faculty <laughs> running that major. And there again, you can look at um, a vested interest. I mean, I, I try to be as optimistic and as 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 uncynical as at least two. It's late in the day for me here, so forgive me. But as as I try to avoid cynicism as much as I can. But on, on occasion, there's a reward system that's been set up by the structures of the university for a department to get as large as it possibly can, right? The question, you know, for the external stuff, sometimes there's only so much you can do. Yes. For the internal stuff, the question that every department, every program needs to ask themselves is that question that I was implicit when I gave the example of my colleague, Kurt, who's an architect. 
are you preparing them not just for what we know now? Are you delivering the content not just that exists now, but are you preparing them for the world they're going to be occupying five years from now, 10 years from now, with problems and knowledge? Are you, in other words, not just delivering the content that needs to be delivered now, but are you preparing them for the content that we don't even know exists? Yeah, that, that of course, is uh, <clears throat> one of those questions that's very difficult to answer because no one can read the future, but we can point to, um, I guess, the general graduate profile of being able to be a leader, an innovator, a scholar, and a citizen. And if we see my degree in education or, or social work or the arts, archaeology, to be, you have to be more than a specialist in this subject because you have to be able to work as a citizen and innovate and lead in yeah. the society you're going, that's going to be yours and your children. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so then it becomes not about quantity, but about the quality. Mm. So it might need, might, you know, the, the, the best education might not be the 15 required courses, mm-hmm. but the 12 required courses. And then these three courses that take things in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Um, to give them more than just the content, you know, because, and, and, and people, it, it, what's intriguing for me, of course, is, you know, I come from a humanities background. So oftentimes people in, in the sciences are a little wary of me at first and that's fine, you know, fair, you know, um, then people don't think like you guys. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, in your field, anything can count. No, no, actually it doesn't work like that because my dissertation writing process would have been a lot quicker if anything could have counted, but, um, (laughs) But I think, you know, once people get to know each other and they settle down and you're, you know, you're over, you're having dinner um, or or drinks or whatever, people sort of talk, they will say, you know, I know from my own experience that, that what my students are going to remember is not the what, it's going to be these, the, these whys and these this one day where we had that really intriguing problem that what we take away there's a lot more affective to it Mm -hmm. than we remember when we're sitting in a room full of colleagues designing the curriculum you know and these maybe little turf battles break out paul when we were both in hong kong uh hong kong government set up a new system where they canceled year 13 of school Mm -hmm. and moved year 13 into the universities Mm -hmm. and told them, you have to do something better than what our school system is doing, which is cramming them for exams. Um, We're going to move the exam to grade 12 and stop all this A-level Gaokao kind of mentality. Uh, Can you do something different? Um, And my own visits, to Hong Kong University in 2015 suggested they were doing some very clever stuff. So do Mm -hmm. you think that it's necessary to abandon a 13-3 system and move to a 12-4 system to get at this curriculum transformation? Or do you think we could still really do it within a 13 plus three system? I think you could do something powerful within a 13 plus three system. I think if you can find things, you know, say for instance, somehow you worked into your 13 plus three system. um, The idea that every single student would have either an internship or an opportunity for for research in a lab or um, a study abroad experience or, you know, one of the other high impact practices. Um, You know, how much do you gain, for instance, by just having a really constructing a really thoughtful first year an impactful first year where the students who are confused <laughs> come away from that year less confused you know with a sense of direction rather than kind of floating in it until you know and just event, you know gradually sinking over the first three years if you can have a more powerful first year i think you that goes a long way if you can be more deliberative about it. Um, would it be easier to do it? 
you know, with a four year thing, perhaps it would. I mean, the interesting thing that I always remember about the Hong Kong experiment, and it's it's not an experiment anymore, but that's what they were calling it at the time, is that um, that they insisted we're going to give you a fourth year, but you can't make general education just in the first year. It has to be spread throughout. Mm. And I think I think what that you know part of the argument there is that it's not we're not when we're talking about general education we're not just talking about basics we're talking about you know cognitively challenging tasks like synthesizing disparate ideas mm -hmm. like evaluating information effectively and figuring out what direction to move forward with um if you're thoughtful about that but let me put it this way you regardless if you have a three-year education system or four-year education system, don't you want that? I guess the tension is, yes, I want my cake, but I also want to don't want to change things the way they yeah, are because no, we're yeah, doing yeah, a good yeah. job the way we yeah, are. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, all right, but, but, and, and that's a legit question. I mean, and, and forgive me, I'm not, and this, I don't mean this in an offensive way, but are you doing a good job the way, you know? And what's the data? I mean, is the data, what's your first year to second year retention? Can you disaggregate that to look at this disenfranchised populations? What's your graduation rate? How long do people stay in the field? How successful are they in the fields that they've studied for? Um, how pleased are, I mean, Hong Kong is one of the best university systems in the world. And 20 years ago, they found out that Hong Kong employers didn't want to hire Hong Kong university graduates because they were good at taking tests and not much else. I'm not saying that's what's going on in New Zealand. I'm not saying that's what's going on at the University of Auckland. No, but uh, those are those are the hard questions I think that has contributed to triggering this curriculum transformation exercise. Yep. Uh, which, if we can find agreement on the nature of the beast and the nature nature of a experimental solution. Perhaps we will get, um, I, I know we had a graduate profile from 2003 and I had a postdoc research fellow and she and I, did, she did some interviews with senior managers, faculty level managers. And uh, the general rule of thumb was, oh, those ideas are ambitions. We don't make much reference to them because we know how to teach architecture and engineering and medicine and arts and we know how to do what we do so why would we care about those graduate yeah. profiles and the university has been pushing to try and make those ambitions trickle down and now we go through an exercise of ticking off learning you know uh learning outcomes appropriate to the course and saying this is what we're doing and tying assessments to those learning outcomes but we i'm not aware of data that says we're making our graduates are anything different than they were before mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i don't know that that evidence exists mm -hmm. and certainly we're reasonably happy with the fact that X percentage go off to grad school in Amer top American or British universities. We're happy that a very high percentage of people go into employment. Uh, we don't graduate many unemployable students. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. that's good. But as a country, we still have major difficulties for the indigenous people of Aotearoa and for mm -hmm. our Pacifica neighbors, um, mm -hmm. many of whom are actually citizens and belong here. And mm -hmm. there is disparity in our country that the mm -hmm. education system is not always overcoming. Though mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I'm personally of the view that schools are not the solution to long term systemic social difference. Um, yes. Kids who come from poor homes might be helped by schools and education in general, but uh, jobs and good homes and three squares on the table and that kind of stuff is mm -hmm. well beyond the responsibility of education. Nonetheless, mm -hmm. uh, 
Could we do be doing a better job? Probably yes. Yeah. I think I, I don't I don't think there's I think the reason the curriculum transformation framework is necessary is because we probably could do better. And we are aware that there's more to simply the assembly line of producing mm -hmm. for the most part good results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But is it just mm -hmm. good results from good students mm -hmm. who would have got there anyway? This is where whatever data you have, if it's not disaggregated, mm -hmm. you know, I would I would strongly encourage that. Take yeah. the data that you have and then break it into pieces and make sure that all populations are being solved. I, you know, one of the things that really in, in implicit within that, you know, the the, the particularly the initial document that I've, mm -hmm. I felt like I was looking at was sort of the, be the beginning of the conversation or the continuation at this moment, the beginning at this moment of the conversation. There was a reference to blue sky, right? Yeah. I, I sort of idealistic mm -hmm. outcomes. The, the fact is, Auckland is a very good university. Yes. One, one way that it can continue or even grow further in a leadership is to be that privileged university that doesn't stop at the easily measurable, you know, which is the box checking that you were talking about. Yeah. And, and looks at those blue skies and says, we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. And we're going to make sure it's happening. And, and, it, and it's going to happen, we're going to measure it not just in, in easily box checked numeric, but we're going to look at the qualitative data as well. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at the affective uh, things like belonging, things like sense of, of meaning in mm -hmm. life, all of those things, bringing that into play. Yeah. Um, I, you know, with the curricular, with a curricular revision, it's, if you don't begin with the outcomes, mm -hmm that's how it devolves into turf war and turf protection yes and if your outcomes are low common denominator <laughs> that's how nothing changes you know um i mean you're, you're right right i mean to keep on picking on architecture or nursing or i don't you know i've got a stun, son studying physics you know yeah we've been teaching it really well for years and years and years and the world has changed and a lot of the content we're delivering you can find on your phone very easily and if we're not doing more than alexis or siri or whatever you know the the, the resource is what are we offering you know, there's a great book by um jose bowen called um the naked teacher where he basically makes a point we what are we doing that is different than information delivery. Uh, we live in a world where information is more easy to access, harder to evaluate. Um, so where, if we live in a world where information can be accessed quickly and easily, what more are we adding? Well, we better be adding the ability to evaluate the quality of that data, the quality of that information. That's what my, where my country has fallen down. Um, you wanna talk Fair about enough. Yeah, populations. We've got, you know, we've got an entire political party that doesn't believe in the value of education at all. Uh, Let alone the reality of current pandemic. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I've, I've Googled it and I'm smarter than the doctors and the scientists. So, yeah. Paul, I'm going to draw this to a close because I could see <laughs> us having a much longer conversation yeah. and anyone watching this might go oh my god when will this ever end um yeah <laughs> so so and and one of the issues that has occurred to me as we talked is uh, the the impact of being a commuter campus versus a residential campus and and so there are many other things that we could discuss but i want to stop there because i think uh i actually feel a little more optimistic after this conversation <laughs> about how a curriculum transformation might be embedded in our research intensive three-year degrees but it's going to take a lot of courage across all the faculties and all the disciplines to give up some turf mm -hmm. to share together something new and original and perhaps mm -hmm. um, 
our university's commitment to sustainability and the rights and privileges and status of the indigenous people. Uh, mm -hmm. We've been given the name Waipapa Tamata Brau, and that's a whole different kind of university than just the University of Auckland, so or the University of Te Whare Wanango Tamaki Makaurau. So mm -hmm. we've got a different name, and we have an interesting opportunity to change. And I'm a little encouraged by this conversation. Oh. So thank you. Well, I, yeah, my pleasure. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope you're not too surprised that I was able to find some silver linings. But yeah. So, well, good, good. I'm surprised that I found some silver linings. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> fair. 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 Yeah. Let me thank you for um, allowing me to have this conversation with you. I've, I've been, it's been a wonderful experience getting to know more about uh, both what is happening there and sort of where the university would like to go. Um, yeah. Let me know if I can help in any way, shape or form. I, I enjoy these conversations. Great. So. Thank you very much, Paul, for your time. And um, Tia Kaha, be strong. Thank you. Go well. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much for your time, Paul. And I'll you be uh, sending you a copy of this so that you can dis disseminate it if you choose to. Thank you. Very, very kind. All the best.